Hey, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Fantastic. How are you? Brought my coffee. Good. <laughs> good. I got mine too. <laughs> I know we're getting started a little late with our uh, coffee morning, but I know, uh, you know, everyone's got kid duties these days with uh, school starting up. So um, thank you everyone for joining us today. We have a several questions from, from you all that we're gonna walk through. Um, and then after today, if you find you have more questions that you didn't get answered, just shoot them over our way and we'll make sure to cover them in our next um, coffee time with Mike and Megan. So Mike, uh, I think you have a list of questions. So why don't you go ahead and read us off the first question that came in? Yeah, so I think the, the, the first big question was, uh, you know, uh, was, you know, what do we think about the recovery from the volatility we experienced in March? And, you know, kind of what are our opinions on, um, you know, I guess it's a, what happened, right? Where are we today? And then what do we see going forward? Right. Um, I think those are really kind of the big questions on that one. So um, I, I think it really depends um, my, my personal view on it. And when we watch, it really depends on what sectors we're in. Right. So um, if you're looking at big tech and everything else, and if you're a Amazon person and you're a Facebook person and you're, you know, whatever, right. Um, fundamentally, their businesses are growing, and you know what? They're they're the big winners in this whole thing. So, if you've seen them, they're actually up. Um, I think it was over sixty percent over your normal um, uh, accounts, like your normal other stocks, like your blue chips, are up way up. So, um, if you're a big investor in that, you saw a little bit of downtick, and you've been way up. If you're a blue chip investor, dividend type person, um, you're still you're you're just creeping back, right? Um, and those big those big sectors have been dragging up the whole indice. So uh, the one of the biggest things I think that we've been talking about on these is that uh, don't use is the S&P really a good benchmark anymore. Right. Um, because when those companies represent over 20 percent of the entire value of the S&P, are we really actually benchmarking that against an overall economic position in the country? And I would actually say I don't think so anymore. You know, because they represent such a large scale. So simple said is if you're not an investor in it, then you might be missing out. Um, so I think that's really depending on kind of where you're at. You know what I mean? And where the investors are. So if you've been a blue chip person, um, yeah, you're still you're creeping right back in there. Right. Um, but if you have been just a pure tech person, you're probably already broke even. So you have to look at what sectors. Now, if you're a airline person, eh, not so much, right? If you're MGM, not so much. We still got a lot of recovery to come. So I think it's sector by sector and the recovery has not been um, systemic. It has not been across all boards. It's only been in certain favorable sectors, typically um, the growing positions making up for um, kind of the COVID. I don't know what your thoughts on that one or Megan with that, but that's kind of where I've been at. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for sharing, Mike. I think, um, too, a big part of it is, you know, right now we're seeing we're seeing a V-shaped recovery, really. And only 17 percent of institutional money managers agree that we're going to see a V-shaped recovery, that a lot of them are feeling like the the markets are not indicative of true economic um, growth during this time mm -hmm. and a lot of it's so just like you're saying a lot of the a lot of the rise in the stock market has been pushed by the top five companies facebook apple google um amazon mm -hmm. um i was just reading some um some data this morning that was talking about you know we're not as high as as the multiples were back in the 2000 tech bubble burst um but we're pretty close so um over 300 uh 300 times multiples back then today amazon's about 118 and the rest are about in the 30s that was based on a market watch article that i just uh looked at this morning so yeah i mean i think i think having all of your eggs in one basket still um feeling that the market's going to continue up may not be in line with the way most institutional managers are thinking uh and we've i know we've been positioning a lot of our clients to some other alternatives that um can kind of weather the upcoming most likely storm that we may see in the markets and the other thing is i think you know uh, daniel always brings up on our calls that the cares act and stimulus packages have put so much money into our economy um how much of the you know inflation that we're seeing is true how much of it is just based on stimulus packages ppp loans uh things along that nature the um, economic injury disaster loans all of those items that went into the current recovery so yeah i mean i don't think we're out of volatility to answer the question i think um it's here to stay for a while based on kind of what what happens economically um but hopefully hopefully we don't see another drop as fast as march march was the fastest drop we've ever seen in stock market history so hopefully we don't see that again knock on wood right so yeah 
Yeah, it's sort of funny. Like clients, that we only think people only tend to think that volatility is in one direction, which is down, because that's the time that we feel the pain. But volatility is actually volatility up and volatility down, right? So volatility is not steady. So steady, consistent growth over time tends to build um, large institutional wealth, right? Um, most time, people want to get super aggressive. And what I found from like large pension funds that look for long-term investing, long-term income structures, um, they take what they call a core portfolio and then a, an explore portion of the portfolio where the core positions are good, strong companies, but we're looking for consistency. And then they go out and they try to get larger returns with a smaller percentage of that portfolio where they could live without that money, right? Uh, you know, so you don't take the risk with the money you can't live without, right? You got to look for consistency. You got to look for safety in that world. Um, and, and where we're going across from it. Yeah, I was just listening this morning and you know, there's a, there's trillions of dollars sitting in the sidelines. So, you know, the question is, where is it going? Um, and what are they gonna do with it? Um, you, right. know, you know, to say that inflation, you know, they're talking about inflationary periods now because there's so much money going into it. Um, the question is what's driving, it. you know, mama tells me, my wife tells me, you know, things are a lot more expensive at the grocery store. Why is it transportation? It's risk premium, getting stuff moved now. Right. And that when things are in demand. So so we'll start to see. I know they have the Fed meeting today, I believe, um, in Jackson Hole. So we'll see kind of what they go with that. Um, the other thing that was interesting with it is, um, you know, what I was looking at this morning is that there's a five to one ratio, which I thought was pretty interesting. Five times more money, five, five dollars for five dollars for every one is actually going into bonds right now as opposed to equities. So people are spending $5 on their bonds and $1 um, on equities right now, which is pretty interesting. It's been kind of a role reversal, um, you know, and it's been actually flying into different bonds and a lot of it's in high yield. So that was another position that with high yield, high yield bonds are like your low credit score bonds, um, just for, for clients out there. Um, think of your 650s, 550s, right? Um, and they're still gonna see bankruptcies. They're expecting about 20% bankruptcies out there um, over the time. But if you widen it out the, the, the net big enough, uh, we'll have an opportunity not to catch the losses. But, you know, they had one of the worst quarters they've seen in a long time, lots of losses in March, but then they turned around and then ultimately had one of their best quarters. And so um, depending on when you bought to that sector, but um, that leads to the really the big question we've got, which is number two, which is, hey, I'm not earning money in my bank. Where do I go? Right. So right. Um, people, people hear the word bonds and they're like, oh, well, it's safe. So um, I don't remember if I had mentioned this in one of our other calls. Uh, you know, but one of the funniest things is we talk about marketing. So uh, a lot of our clients, uh, you know, grew up in the 80s or, you know, about, you know, you were could be investors during the 80s. And there was a big thing called junk bonds. And if you ask clients today, hey, do you want to buy some junk bonds? Everyone's like, I don't want any junk bonds. Well, the reality is there's more money flowing in junk bonds now than historically we've seen in a long, long time. And that's what they call high yield bonds. So the number one thing we've talked about before is don't get you know uh, misinformed in the idea that you're getting a high yield bond that is as safe as a lower yield bond, which is like one and two percent today, because they're willing to pay you know maybe five percent. But um, you know because not all bonds are made equal. And so what we're seeing today is what's what's actually interesting. And I was looking at is the new high yield bond right now is paying about three to four percent. So basically, it's paying the same rate AAA bonds were paying a year ago. Um, right. So, you know, that yield has been going down. So what are our other options and how do we make money for our clients? I think that, that was the kind of the other question. Say, so, hey, if I'm not earning money in my bank, where do I go? And when, how do we make money there? So um, that was another kind of question. So I don't know what your thoughts are around that and what you wanted to share and kind of your answer. No, yeah. And I think just to summarize kind of what you, I think you were trying to say, what I heard you say mm -hmm. is that, you know, just because something's repackaged from junk bonds to high yield doesn't make it any less risky. That's it's just correct. really a marketing ploy. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I just want to summarize that for you guys on the call in case, um, you in case you missed that, but yeah, I think um, I think that's totally true. Just the idea of you know making your money work for you. Right now, bank accounts are paying you know if you're lucky 0.81 percent. CDs are at one. Maybe if you're really lucky, one and a half. If you tie it up for a long time, so mm -hmm. um, how can you make the money work a little harder? So we've been talking to clients about some different strategies. Um, and I'm going to let you talk about, Mike, the Clark Capital Bond um, Management Sleeve because I think that that is a really great option for someone who doesn't want to give up necessarily liquidity but still have the money working for them a little harder than that money just sitting on the sidelines and really at the bank. Um, but also, we sent out some communication, but I'll just kind of go over it real quick too. You know, multi-year guaranteed annuities are the insurance company's really competition to CDs at the bank. Um, and the difference 
difference is that you know because they um, because they grow tax deferred, unlike a CD at the bank, your taxable equivalent yield at the end of a MIGA multi-year guaranteed annuity, some people call them fixed annuities, um, you know, is actually going to be higher. So even if you have a CD at the bank that's paying 1% and then a MIGA that's paying 1%, at the end of three years, let's say you're in a three-year term, at the end of three years, you're going to actually um, net a higher taxable equivalent yield. What, you know, what does that mean after you pay taxes, right? The IRS always wants their cut of your interest. And so, um, so so that's just something to think about. Um, current MIGAs are in the two range for a three-year term, um, and that's more competitive than we're seeing from the banking channel. Even the online-only banks like Ally and Capital One 360, all of those offerings that typically can offer a little bit of a higher um, rate of return. But um, yeah, so will you fill us in kind of on that car on that uh, bond yeah. management strategy? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, hey, I was going to say, you know, I remember, I think I was at like, what, two, almost 2%, two point something in my ally account. You know, I use it as my cash reserve and I think I got another email that they get me down to 1% now or 0.7 and they're supposed to be the highest paying out there, you know, crazy. Yeah. Crazy Mine went so, down to 0. 0.8. Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. I, I don't, I, I, you know, I used to be excited about the number was I don't watch it anymore. So uh, I, I don't know if everybody else feels like that, but I'm not watching that anymore. And it was nice seeing actual money going into my savings account, um, you know, for a few months, uh, but uh, not, not so much anymore. So, so yeah, I, I think the, the biggest thing is is when we start thinking about where do we invest money in what in quote unquote fixed income, right? Um, bonds. Um, you have to remember bonds aren't all created equal. So. Uh, the reason that they pay higher interest or the high yield bonds um, are because they're lower credit ratings. Are you lower credit rating, higher risk? Um, which is fine, but the question is, is so how do we balance all of that stuff out? And how do we go from high yield, which will trade like stocks, right? Um, and sometimes they're in favor and sometimes they're not in favor, right? Like we saw in March. Uh, and actually what was in favor were strong bond positions, you know, like AAA rated where people were running money out of high yield, running into safety, driving up the prices of those bonds, right? So how do we as clients and how do we as advisors, where do we go with that? Can we sell our bonds that quick and buy it? And the simple answer is no, you can't. So when you buy a, a bond mutual fund that is only supposed to be short term or only supposed to be medium term, that's all they can buy. So with Clark Capital Management, which full and fair disclosure, no relation to this Clark uh, in any way. No shape, relation. No <laughs> They're in Philadelphia. They were started in the exact same year uh, by a Clark family. They do, you know, um, so, but, and they do like boats too. It's sort of weird how that all works. Um, and they have a compass on their stuff. So that's the full thing <laughs> associated with them. Um, I have had a relationship with them since 2005 and I've met weathered through a lot of storms with them. Um, but what they do is they actively manage uh, the bond exposure. So what they use is they'll use ETFs, exchange traded funds that own baskets of securities and they use interest rate swaps um, that basically allow them to buy and push into high yield and buy the ETF. So the, the ETF is basically, they can buy a $2 billion position paying um, 5%. Now, if they went out and bought all those individual bonds themselves, they might've gotten seven for you. So you're giving up because there's fees and there's there's expenses to ETFs. People think they're right. free or not, right? But they get you five. But what's nice is if they start to see the market moving to a point where high yield is going to go out of favor and you might start losing money or they starts to lose and money starts leaving those positions, they can sell in an instant with one push of a button, right? Or they're able to settle at the end of the day and they can then move that money into a cash position or into a U.S. Treasury position or a AAA rated positioning you for a while. As that part of that market falls apart, that money's going to run somewhere else. Right. And they're going to buy U.S. government ETF or directly into cash um, while that whole market figures itself out. That's what we saw. So in the high yield market in March, we saw that they were way, way down. We lost about four and a half percent for that period because they had then sat out of it. Right. And then all of a sudden they tacked back into it when money started going back in there. So it allows them to actively manage it um, over periods of time. And basically when high yields in favor, they're able to buy it. You're not going to get the highest of the high yield. Right. Um, and same thing, you're not going to get the high, you know, but then you have the safety of them being able to trade it out. Um, if you're interested in it, yeah, and trading it out, allowing it to be actively managed. Um, and, you know, there, there's a great opportunity for it. We have uh, limited, you know, we have uh, almost at any amount. Um, one, one thing we need to caveat with that is, is that um, because it is actively managed, it can create, um, you know, short term capital gains, um, which is ordinary income for clients. So if you're in a high tax bracket, there's other strategies around municipals um, that, that they use. Um, you know, so we have to be careful the type of money. 
um, when we do that, you know, because that once again, taxes are road gains, right? But what's nice is you only have to pay taxes when you have gains, right? So exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's um, it's a catch twenty two. I was just, we we're just, I was just talking to the client about this the other day. You know, we were talking about, um, and a question came into the chat, Mike. So I'm just gonna kind of read, uh, okay. paraphrase it real quick. It just says essentially, what defensive moves do we recommend to investors to weather the potential uh, market debacle? So, um, just like I think we were talking about before, only 17% of institutional managers believe that, you know, we're, we're in a V-shaped recovery, meaning that we're not going to have another downturn. And so um, I think the question that came in is just really um, kind of just what we're talking about. So what we've been doing with a lot of clients is moving out of equities into positions like the bond sleeve, like some other um, more conservative options and locking in those gains. Well, what happens when we lock in those gains is sometimes if it's a non-qualified account, account um, or a taxable account, a non-IRA, Roth IRA account, then we're, we're creating a tax bill. So sometimes it can be a catch-22 um, to if we want to cre create the tax bill, excuse me, um, versus, you know, weather the storm and just kind of ride out the portfolio. Um, so I do think that what we've been talking about with clients is moving into some fixed income structures, moving into this bond management sleeve like you're talking about, which is um, a much more lucrative spot than being in a bond mutual fund um, for NAV pricing risk and everything along those lines. Um, and then also, you know, using um, using some other tools like like the multi year guaranteed annuities. If we if we think that this this volatility storm is going to last, you know, three five years. Um, we can look at those MIGAs. We can look at some other tools um, that I think we've chatted about before. But um, Mike, too, I'll kind of let you take the reins and run on on the idea of the buffered annuity that we've been moving people into as well out of their equity positions um, because it allows you to still partake in the upside and protect yourself a little bit on the downside, um, but not lock you into a place where you're only going to earn, you know, three, four percent. So, um, yeah. So if you'll just kind of explain that i know that's more your background too on that variable side so i'd love to hear your thoughts on it yeah so i think that it's a great question um i think a first couple of things we need to consider when we're with clients this is what's nice about not having a cookie cutter approach for our clients right so a um so so once again i don't know who did chat box i actually i can't see it um but did that come from uh one of my 40 year old clients one of our 50 year old clients or a 65 year old client right so um that's sort of the first thing that we have to consider, right? And then that pile of money that they're considering when they think about when they typed in their question, uh, what was the purpose of it, right? And what was their time? Right. So, you know, we're having a cookie cutter approach where you know a lot of clients will come, well, what's your average rate of return for your portfolio of this? I'm like, well, what was the We claim? don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, if, if, if an investment firm wants to tell what their average rate of return is for each one, that tells you right out of the gate that what they do is they have a cookie cutter approach. They tell you what their clients are going to do. And if you're... Uh, you know, uh, and, and believe it or not, there's a local money manager. You are one of four colors, actually. And if yes. And if you're Asian, you're a color, right? Um, if you're in this one. So so if they're able to tout that stuff, that means you're in a mo in, in their strictly model where you're effectively, we don't tailor make. You know, we have models, we use stuff we do, but we ultimately bring the portfolio together and tailor make it for the client using multiple different sleeves, right? Um, so we, we, we blend it together. So um, so that's sort of the first thing when I look at those questions, but trying to do a broad base is going to be a, is this, is that, you know, for the, since 2009, um, active management has been kind of out of favor, right? Um, you could have done, you know, a kind of, a you know, dart at the wall buy the S and P everybody's going to make money. I think that today is, is how are we mitigating risk is by using active management, right? So for a younger client, it's going to be active management. So, um, once again, you know, uh, and even in, in equities today. So some of the positions we're using, and it also depends on the account balance. Um, so one thing I could use with everybody that would be on the call would be a, an actively managed ETF strategy where as we see favor, just like fixed income total return, right? With Clark, we could right now we're sitting in growth, right? And as growth comes out of favor, we might go to, we're gonna go to high value because we wanna go to a value stock because that's gonna, you know, basically weather more of that storm. And so you wanna be tactical in nature for say, right? For a client, right? Yeah. Um, and how we do it all the way. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, so just to explain active management, because to us, that makes so much sense. But to, to a lot of people and some people I know that are on the call, 
um, they may not understand what we're talking about. So, you know, the difference between um, the way that we access equities typically versus uh, a typical, you know, money manager, whether it's Merrill, um, you know, whoever, whomever, um, is that we're using um, institutions institutional managers, registered investment advisors that are using SMA accounts. So um, separately managed accounts are managed at a higher level um, than if you if you and I were just managing the money, right? So if um, John and Jane Smith came in and met with you or I, um, we wouldn't pick, you know, 10 positions and then tell them that we were going to keep an eye on it. What, what we're doing is we're allocating clients to managers. Um, kind of like your own tailored mutual fund. It's really just like a better version of a mutual fund. You see what you own, you see what you're paying in fees, you see all the movement, um, and they're able to be a lot more agile than a mutual fund. So they're able to pull to cash if they want to. They're able to um, buy and sell things more on a um, holistic basic basis without worrying about fluctuating the NAV price. You know, I think one of the one of the things that a lot of investors that we speak to don't understand with mutual funds is that when you're, let's say, you know, Mike, you're, you're managing the Vanguard, you know, total stock, um, you know, ETF or, or mutual fund or whatnot, and you want to sell out of your Apple position, right? That's going to change your NAV significantly. Um, and, and so that's different than if an investor holds Apple directly, which is what happens in an SMA account, and then that Apple position gets liquidated. It doesn't affect the whole the whole bucket. It just affects that one um, asset. So I just want to make sure that everyone on the call understands what active management is as we're using that term. Yeah, so it's pretty. I mean, I'm sorry. I always appreciate you. You always tell me to pump my brakes, and I appreciate that. No, that's I, okay. Yeah. We're we're yin and yanging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'll go back. It's pretty simple. So when you buy a mutual fund, right? Like, and, and people don't really buy a mutual fund or an ETF uh, for that nature, and you're buying a, a growth ETF, right? And you're going to be a uh, large cap growth. OK, um, and let's just say that you're the manager and you're a large cap growth manager for any company and you see um, the light at the end of the tunnel. And then all of a sudden that light at the end of the tunnel, you realize is a train. OK, so the simple answer is, is that you have no choice but to stay on that track and get hit by the train. Right. Just that simple. Um, right. An active manager, right, um, has the ability to step off of the tracks, let the train go by and then step back on and see what mess is left. Um, you know, and see what would happen to everybody else. And that's a lot of times is opportunity. And so that's a very broad way that I've explained it um, in the past. Now, um, the one question we do have, uh, we do get a raw at times as well. Does that mean they can just go into one position? No, we set rules, right? There are rules that they have to manage to. And if there's not some fly by night, they have a, you know, an epiphany in the middle of the night sometime that they're going to sell everything and buy one position. They can't do that, but they do have the opportunity to move off of the tracks that you know within say they can't go to a new train track they can step out of the way for a little while and come back into it so you know uh, we use a lot right. of the, either individual stock or etfs to do that depending on the client's account balance so active management can say hey growth is in favor right now all the money's flowing there we can ride it out Ooh, growth is real scary right now these companies don't have uh you know a, a firm foundation in the economy they're going to be really really beat up because there's a lot of froth there money is leaving let's go to value let's go back to our coca-colas let's go back to our big companies and they're able to trade inside of that and they have rules that they're set by um and that's what that active management is so that's how we weather the storm um yeah. is buying find places to hide and i do want to say like i don't in no way do we believe in timing the market, right? It just doesn't work. Right. You're never going to hit the perfect top. You're never going to hit the perfect bottom. It's just not going to happen. But what we can do with active management is mitigate future risk that's predicted. Like right now, we have bankruptcy after bankruptcy after bankruptcy being filed. This morning, you have Hurricane Laura pounding, you know, our southern southern coast of Louisiana and Texas. And, you know, that's going to create certain, it's going to create certain events and from an economic standpoint. And so active managers can assess real-time situations yep. and predict, you know, what's going to move forward and mitigate some risk there. Again, we're not saying that you're going to time the market a hundred percent. It's just not going to, never going to happen. Right. So, um, but definitely looking towards the future and mitigating some of that risk is something that we're always you know, doing with our clients. And I think um, for 
the equity managers that are saying, oh, you know, buy and hold or just hang in there. It's going to come back. That's just not good enough for us anymore. M money's moving so fast in the market today. It's, it's very different than the 70s and the 80s, right? When, um, you know, when, when we didn't have the internet and trading like we do today. Today, you have the, the Robinhood app where, you know, you have 18 year olds investing, um, buying, buying shares of, what was it hurts as it was filing bankruptcy so yeah there's yeah. there's just a lot of um crazy movement going on in the market so what's yeah, our next question I'm oh sorry, sorry. And, and Robinhood crashed like what three times in the middle of march because people trying to sell so fast and their servers couldn't even put up with it so you wonder what right. kind of market dis disruptions do you see in that standpoint and then yeah that would be kind of the idea i, I think just i just want to if you don't mind for the next question is just a caveat yeah it's not about it's not about timing the market it's about finding consistency and saying inside of looking to protect it not always maximizing returns or it's just it's about finding a set of rules and sticking with them to protect clients and if we can make a simple thing of we can see the train on the tracks let's just take a quick step to the left let it happen not hey we have to buy this because tesla is going to be up right now you know what i mean like right. the next 15 minutes that we're going to trade up that's not what we're talking about here but it's saying hey we see that this sector might be in a lot of trouble because you can't fly anymore people can't travel let's see if we can sell out of that because a larger economic impact is going to happen in that area um where like mutual fund managers can't do that um in a sense if that's what their investment policy statement says they are stuck there riding out that storm so yeah i, I firmly believe it and that is the last one i got yesterday from a client too um you know which is well as long as we outperform the market we'll be fine i'm like well you mean outperform the market so if the market does 12 we should do 14 right you're going to be happy you know, and then on the flip side, it's like, so if I outperform the market, but drops 24, you want to lose 30, right? Is that what you mean by outperform the market? Because once again, volatility is on up, volatility is on down. No, it's fine. Consistency over time. And she kind of looked at me and was like, okay, fine. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I say, because at the end of the day, if it drops 24 and we lose 10, I think I've done my job. You know exactly. What I, mean? but I think we've done a good job for our clients by losing less in the downs, right? Which also means we give it up on the ups. So um, other question was, is, you know, um, what was it? It's uh, I've been let go because of, you know, kind of current market conditions. Right. Um, and should I use my retirement funds or maybe if I have a HELOC, you know, where, where do I pull money from to, to make and meet? Um, I have a couple of thoughts around that um, and, and to, you know, until we do it. But um, I figured I'd have you lead off with that one. So. Yeah, that's a, obviously some people are in that tough situation right now. I know. One of, one of our clients, um, you know, was laid off and then, uh, or furloughed and then hired back and then let go. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are kind of feeling the effects of the requirements of the PPP loan. So if different corporations receive that, there's um, mandates along like how long they have to have their FTEs, full-time employees. Um, yeah. so it's been a little um, frothy in the hiring job market. You see people hiring people back. Part of that is just to fulfill PPP loan um, requirements so that they don't have to pay back that PPP loan so that it gets forgiven. But um, I do think that, you know, in, in pertaining to the question, it just depends on the client. I think, you know, if the client is over 59 and a half, it's a different discussion because you're not going to be assessed that 10% um, extra withdrawal penalty. And also, what what does your total outlook look like? Um, a home equity line of credit can be a great way to, to kind of cover expenses in the short term. Um, but there is a lot of debate from the CPA community about um, whether HELOCs are deductible, tax deductible, based on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, I actually sat in the Northern Virginia Association of CPAs last year for a breakfast symposium and it was four hours long and you had CPAs arguing on stage about whether it was tax deductible or not. So I think it's just one of those gray areas, unfortunately, in the tax code. So it's um, definitely a personal question um, depending on their their own uh, you know situation. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I hate to give a vague answer. I say that a lot. I hate to give a vague answer, but it really just depends on the person. Um, and is there another way to fund it? You know, I think um, is, is there a spouse with a 401k that you can take a loan against? Um, so there's just, there's other, there's other thoughts to think about too. What, what do you think about that, Mike? Yeah. So I, I think there are a couple answers on there is, you know, uh, it really depends on economic what happened to banks. So I can go back to kind of, you know, we've been in economic, it's been quite a while since we've been in economic stress at this level. So 
A um, couple of things with it. A, retirement funds. Yeah, you. It, what is nice, you could amortize over if you took money out of your retirement accounts today, right? You can actually amortize the tax because you've been affected by COVID, right? Related thing. You can amortize the tax over three years. So that's a really good play. So right. you actually if you lost your job. You could actually take the money out. You need it. Um, and then ultimately sell the reduction in your income and actually take it out, spread it out over three years and believe it or not, pay lower tax rates than you might if you were working, right? Yeah, that can actually be a that's really part of the CARES thing. Act, correct? Yeah, that's in the CARES Act, that's correct. Um, yeah. The HELOC's an interesting thing because what people tend to think is just because they have it today doesn't mean they have it tomorrow. The banks have the right to reduce that. So I just worked with a client recently. Uh, we were able to pay down, um, you know, I have a client, um, it was a good referral from their kid. You know what I mean? I work with their parents and you know, they, they, we paid off $10,000 off a credit card. Um, the first thing the credit card company did was boom, drop their limit to three. So, um, and when I, you know, ran my family business uh, back, uh, you know, years ago, we were in this kind of similar situation and I used it as an operating account for money in, money out for like a kind of a bridge for my 60 and my, my 90 days. And what happened was when the economic the money got tight, every time we paid down the line, they actually dropped my limit giving me less and less access to capital. So, you know, hand monthly lines are always good that you have to pull them in advance, right? Because you have to put out your income. So, you know, it, it might be good to go get them today, um, but also know that they're not there forever. So, you know, if you pull the line, just hold the line, you know, sometimes, or if you, if people have already pulled home equity lines, just pay the payments, leave your cash on hand. Cause right now cash is king, right? Um, I don't know about paying them on the bills, but just, you know, they'll, they'll if you have one, you can pull it, that's fine. Um, but you always have to make sure you have enough to make that payment. Cause if you kind of fall behind, they'll lock the whole thing down too. Right. Um, you know, this is a very gray area. Um, yes. you know, and it's client by client. Uh, and it's, you know, these are, these are those things where, you know, it really takes an advisor to look at what's in your specific situation. Right. Um, and then how does it work? So, you know, if you have a client with a steady job, I just actually, uh, just, uh, yesterday had a client, we were going through that. They're moving from here to, to Florida. And they had so many questions in related to his job. They actually had to remove him off of the loan um, because there were so many questions. About it. They were going to issue a loan. So they got it in her name. So, you know, you also have to think about it that way. You know, ask it, what is your job? What's the stability of your job, you and your spouse? Um, and then that'll tell you kind of where the money should come from, you know, but just, right. know, you know, if you don't get access to it or you start to pay it back. So, you know, somebody might, you know, pull home equity line, get an inflow of cash. Oh, I'm going to pay it off. Well, just because you pay it off doesn't mean they're not going to drop the line too. So it's very case by case basis. Um, and, yeah. and you do it. And so I think that's the idea. But I really do like the idea of pulling money out and amortizing it over a three year period if someone's in that in that case. I mean, there could be other strategies around that as well. You know, if you're really really affected. Yeah, I mean, the other thing about about you know the current tax brackets is that you know there's pending no future legislation changes. They're set in force until 2026. Right. Right. You know, and so right now, actually, brackets are lower than they were in 2017. Mm -hmm. So from 2018 to 2026, we actually have lower tax brackets. So that's another big um, point. I think was one of the questions was about Roth conversion. And I think the idea and why we're talking to clients so much and we've talked in previous videos about Roth conversions is we know what tax brackets are today. And um, I heard this analogy the other day and I just, I wanted to share it with you because I think, I think it makes so much sense. You know, your IRA account um, is, is like this analogy. So, so let's say uh, Mike, you and I go into business. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we start a business and um, I tell you, Hey, um, here's the deal. I only want 15% of the profits so you can take the rest of the profits but I'll you know I'll keep working and you're like okay cool this sounds great right sounds like a yeah. good business deal and um, the, the the caveat is the catch right because there's always a catch to everything pros and cons to everything the catch is, is at some point in the future Mike I get to tell you what what percentage of profits that I want. And oh. so five years from now, I may increase 15% up to 75%. Does that sound like a good a good idea to you? Oh, uh, no, I like fixed expenses. I like to know what things are gonna cost. Right, yeah, so I think one of, one of the things that we're we're talking to clients about a lot is Roth conversions because mm -hmm. your IRA account is just like that business relationship. You're in your IRA, you have a business relationship with the IRS saying that you're going to pay them some amount of taxes on that money in the future, right? Yep. When you look at your IRA statement, like our clients need to make sure that when they look at that million dollars on the bottom of the statement or whatever it says, um, 
the, that million dollars is not all theirs. They, they have a business partner and three letters, the IRS, and you have to pay taxes. And the, the question is, how much taxes are you going to pay? So I think another big thing that we've talked about before is the, the changes from the SECURE Act that were passed at the end of the year to those IRAs, and if you leave them at beneficiaries and things like that. Um, so we'll talk about that too. But I think I think the Roth conversion is such an important conversation for all of our clients to be talking about right now because we know that tax brackets are lower from now until 2026 than they were previously, and they are going to be as long as the current legislation stays in place. So if legislation changes, which it can, legislation risk is something that um, you and I plan for and, and hope hope to plan for, but some of those risks you just can't, um, you, you can't, you know, predict. So I think right. one of the, the big conversations is, should I take my IRA, pay the taxes now, and convert it to the Roth so that 10 years from now, if the IRS raises my tax tax bracket from 15 to 75 percent, um, which you know I think is a little bit of overkill, um, but just for the example, um, yep. you know you're not going to be paying giving away 750 thousand dollars out of that million in, in the balance in your IRA. Um, so that's just that's just something to keep in mind from a tax bracket planning standpoint, um, and to talk about you know fixed expenses. Anyways, got on tangent. Sorry. Well, no, you're you're good. <laughs> it's always the it's always the way that I remember stuff. You know, I always struggle between what's gross and what's net, right? And so what what's gross is what I started with, and what what, what kills me is what I catch in net at the end. Um, right. It's not about <laughs> what you get. To, it's not about what you make. It's about what you get to keep. That, so, that's correct. Yeah, and yeah. and I and I think that that's very very important um, as we go into this, right? Like you have to make sure that that you know what you're doing. Roth conversions are very very important. Um, you know, we know what we have today. Um, and you just have to do it on adult supervision, um, you know, and, you know, what other IRAs do you have out there? What's the most effective way to do it? Um, and I, and I think that's, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. Um, yeah. I had another thought that was floating around, but maybe I'll get back to it. But yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, um, we know that rates. I mean, there's, there's a couple of things. Oh, um, you know, I also, and I don't even know the legislation, right? Cause you know, they're basically the way the tax code is, it reverses back to the way it was. So Correct. the brackets sunset go back. Provision. Yeah. So yeah, the sunset provision. So what was also interesting is I've, I've, I've kicked around and I don't know what's going to happen. I do a lot of the, the calculations and sometimes I'll sit in the room and draw things and, you know, look at it. But you know, it, when it sunsets, um, do they go back to the, the old rates? And what I mean by that is, is that that there's been what they call bracket creep over the years. Every year they every year they amortize it up. So are we actually going to lose ten years worth of bracket creep effect, or eight years worth of bracket creep? Are they when they say it goes back, is it going to go back to 2016 standard incomes, where if our incomes have slowly amortized up and grown over time, that we're going to be retroactive all the way back to ten uh, effectively almost ten years ago? And right. that could be the rate. And I don't know. I don't think a hey, nobody knows that answer, right? So, so that's going to be a dramatic effect in kind of what your effective tax rates are. That was been another one. Um, and then you know, so I, I've considered that. So let's get it out of the way. Um, last thing on that one, um, and just for this one. So if everybody wants to have the coolest uh, question, actually, I wonder if the chat bot works. So does anybody know what the uh, what the A and IRA stands for? See if there's any question out there. I see we have one of those. Does anybody know what the A, what it was IRA stand for? Can't wait all day, but we'll see. We'll, got anything yet? Is somebody typing? Um, I think there's some people typing. Let's see. I know we have Michelle on moderating for us. So okay. she she's um She'll send the chats over as they come. So, okay. yeah. So um, we could also we'll do a poll too. We'll see what anybody comes back with. But you're not yeah. allowed to Google it. You're not allowed to Google it. Just let me know what you think. I see <laughs> one answer so far. Uh, one answer came in account. Okay. Um, well, let's wait a few minutes though to see what other answers come in because we have several lots of people on the call today. So okay, got gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we've got that one. All right. I guess the next question we had in there, which was um we came as you is now a time to buy real estate. Interest rates are so low. Do we buy real estate? Right? Right. Um, yes. This that. is a this is a good question. I I feel I feel strongly about this question. And I want to talk about oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> Should I duck? <laughs> no. <laughs> um I think, you know, I think it depends. Again, it's a personal, you know, it's where you are in your life. Is this a vacation property? Is it a primary residence? Mm -hmm. Everything along those lines. I think the really important thing when we're looking at real estate is to understand, yes, interest rates are low. So you're going to be able to 
qualify for a much larger loan than you would if interest rates were high. Um, so I do think from a cash flow perspective, you just need to make sure that you're you're able to cover the mortgage payment and everything like that. And um, Mike or I can help you with that if you're not sure. But I do think another thing is that buying real estate today, understanding where we are in the cycle is really important. So um, even two, two and a half years ago now, when I bought the, the office, uh, you know, Mike, that, that you're sitting in right now, <laughs> um, you know, I pretty much realized that we were at the top of the real estate bubble and now we're even higher, right? So when you look at um, real estate and in the, in the DC area, we're in a little bit of a, a microclimate for real estate. So it's a little different, but when you look around the country, um, we're finally getting back up to those 2007 numbers from a real estate perspective. There's some areas of the country that are still not back up there, but real estate always occurs in cycles. And so where are we in the cycle? So I always caution clients, if you're going to buy real estate now, it could be a really, really great decision as long as it's a long-term hold. We don't want to be buying real estate that we're trying to flip right now. I think that that is where you're going to get into trouble and um, be in a position that you could possibly... Um, um, lose and we don't obviously want to be there so I think you know a big part of real estate is obviously personal what 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 can you afford um, whatnot but real estate can be a great addition to the portfolio um, it, it can be a great wealth generating tool to you know have your your first starter home and rent it out so that someone else is paying your mortgage down and it can be a great tool it just kind of depends about um you know what makes sense there and i think you know another question that we've seen a lot come in from clients is about um about real estate in general like so we're at the top of the cycle but what about you know this now remote working environment real mm -hmm. estate's going to go up in flames um i've heard from clients and i just um I think there's definitely truth to that. However, I also I also believe and know that a lot of corporations are spreading out, right? They're creating socially distant office spaces. So your idea of cubicle lands are going away. I know Capital One headquarters right here in McLean that just built a brand new building is literally gutting every single floor and going in and spreading out all of their desks. Um, I have a good friend that works there. So I, I think, you know, I think understanding that there's a lot of corporations that have to operate in office space. A lot of our government facilities that operate out of skip buildings and stuff like that. Um, and then also the square footage per employee is going to have to be a lot larger than what it was before to make sure that all employees feel comfortable and safe, safe going to work. Um, so I don't, I don't disagree that you're probably going to see a little bit of shift from remote work, um, you know, to remote work and less office workers. But I do think that there's also an office environment that you don't get at home and, and some people really thrive off of that. So um, unless the corporations, yeah, you're pointing at yourself, unless corporations can um, figure out culture and make sure that they're incorporating remote and um, everything. Survey Monkey is a huge company that operates remote and in office. But yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just, I think um, if you're looking to buy real estate, it can be a really great tool. Interest rates are really low. Um, you know, if you have a current mortgage above, above 4%, it, it may make sense to refinance depending on your situation. Obviously there's a cost to that. So, but yeah, I mean, those are my thoughts. Um, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, uh, there, there's a lot in there. I think, um, Hey, I pointed to myself because, um, you know, my, my, you know, I did, I did a couple of days, my kids, uh, Work for a few, then all of a sudden, my oh my kids' chores got done around the house, but none of my work got done when I worked from home. So you know, it's probably a little right. bit easier. Um, but I also like I like that break, right? That difference between you know the, the house and whatnot. And I have that opportunity where some people don't um, to do both, right? Um, and and have that. So so that's nice. But yeah, I, I think it's also I think it's it's when it comes to real estate, it's definitely going to be. Um, it's definitely going to be one of those things that is, is you specific and what are your plans, right? So a lot of the questions are, you know, a, if it's primary residence and it's and you want a fixed expense, that's fine. It makes sense to me. You buy because you're long term. Um, I've done a lot of math for a lot of clients over the years and sometimes they're appreciative. Sometimes they're not. I just did the math for my dad the other day and he doesn't make as much money as house as he thought he did after I did the right. actual purchase. But you got to have a place to live, right? And so that's nice. Um, so if it's long term, it's locked in there. Um, I, I firmly believe that if you're not in the rental business, um, in the real estate business, you should not dabble in it because when we dabble in stuff, people get in trouble, right? That's kind of my personal opinion on it. And I've seen a lot of that. I've unbundled a lot of real estate um, dabbling over my years now and help getting people out of those, you know, in the, in the proper manner. 
Uh, and so that's a, a point. The lower interest rates are also driving up prices, right? Because they can afford more. So ultimately they're driving up the price. So we're buying artificial value again. Definitely. You know? And so what will happen, right? So you have to think about that. The other things that kind of scare me, um, I guess, or give me hesitation when we think about it is some of these conversations where, hey, if I rent my place now, I can afford this one here with the mortgage payment. So a lot of times what I hear from clients is as long as they lease, right, that current property, they, they can then go buy another property. Well, can your budget support both mortgages and for how long? Right. And that's where I see a lot of those those challenges. So if you're in positive cash flow, remember, and an an something is only an asset when it provides positive cash flow above and beyond its expenses. Otherwise, it's a liability. If money has to come out of your pocket to keep its value. That's a liability. It's not an asset. Right. You know, um, and houses are definitely one of those things. So if you have positive cash flow above it or what it costs to sustain its value, then we have an asset. Otherwise, we have a liability um, that can run into run into trouble. Um, the right. other thing to consider about the rental markets is what's going on now. So um, Quaintance um, owns a property across or all the way out in Oregon, I believe, where they have it. They really want to sell their home that they've currently rented. Well, based on Oregon's rules, they put a moratorium on evictions and the ending of leases. They actually don't, their tenants don't have to pay their mortgage and they can't. So now we've got the client halfway across the country. The government says, the local government says you can't evict them. You can't, you have to auto renew their lease and they don't even have to pay. So now they've got the government telling them that they cannot liquidate their property or sell it. And they're not getting positive, yeah. right? So those are some of the things that may be considered, especially in these time frames um, when we start thinking about buying property. So I think if you're looking for a residential deal and you're going to be there long term, cool. Um, I think if we're getting into the rental markets and especially from the flipping standpoint, eh, you know, um, I have a friend that did it for you know last ten years and he's basically punched out. Um, most people don't know that I grew up kind of in the in the, you know I spent a lot of time in the building industry and building homes and stuff like that. Uh, what, what I thought was the most interesting thing that I learned was that in the, the 2000, you know, uh, the builders that I knew after I left, so 2005, six, seven, so I'd already been in the industry for a few years, but you know, they had already liquidated all of their property and they were actually renting. Most of the builders I worked with that were successful that actually did it. By the time the housing bubble exploded, they had already rented. And a lot of them used the cash they had on hand to buy the properties back or buy properties at cut rates. And then they ultimately made profit in there. So just, you know, kind of that's why you don't dabble in it. You know what you're doing. That's sort of that thing. Did we get any uh, answers on the IRA thing? Yes. Yeah, so some more came in and then I know we need to finish up here because yep. we're just about out of time. But um, someone said asset. Um, and so we got asset and account. We got several of those that came in. We got several accounts. Okay. What does it stand for? It means arrangement. The A is arrangement. So Ooh. the IRA is individual retirement arrangement. So right. who do we make arrangements with? Business partners. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. So yeah. So I mean, again, the, I think the business partner analogy is so good to make sure we're keeping mm -hmm. in mind. And um, and it's not our client's fault, right? IRAs were really probably their only option uh, through their yep. 401ks originally. Um, Roth 401ks came later. So I think, um, you know, it's just, what do we do now with this huge, huge uh, arrangement, quote unquote, yep. that we have? Um, and how do we make it better so that we can um, hopefully pay less on our social security taxation, less on our Medicare premium, that's the provisional income calculation. Um, so yeah, so from a financial planning standpoint, just how do we make the best out of the IRA? And so I think, I think there was, um, I saw one question about um, clients that went, move out of state and I got this actually yesterday from a brand new referral that came into us. They were asking, yeah, in, in two years, I don't want to live here anymore, right? A lot of people don't stay in the DC area. It's expensive. Um, Pre-pandemic, pre, uh, we've had a lot of traffic. There's still traffic now, but a little less, I think. But um, people don't want to stay here. So what happens when they move if they're working with us? And what happens to their accounts? And there are other mm -hmm. options available, I think, was the question. So, um, you know, the, depending on the state that you're in, there may be some different insurance type tools, but um, securities are pretty much the same in every single state. So unless you're um, moving, you know, to another country, then that's a different discussion. Again. We have lots of clients that have moved back to Canada. We have clients that um, are living in Africa right now. Clients kind of all over. So it just kind of depends on, you know, your situation as to what it, what needs to happen. So we'll definitely walk you through that. But um, I don't think there's a big 
there's not a big difference if you stay here versus move somewhere else, especially now everyone's gotten used to this technology. So, um, you know, it makes it easier for us to stay in touch with everyone. So I think that's a big point too. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think I, there were any other questions other than that, correct? Yeah, I think that, um, I think that there was, there was one more, but I do have uh, one thing to consider actually a couple of things. Um, it depends on, so you have the, there's, there's the, especially in this area, we do a lot of military, uh, we deal with a lot of stuff moving, right? So right. Um, one thing you want to consider when we're moving states, um, a income tax, right? So that could be a different issue, but also capital gains taxes. So people don't think about that. They're like, oh, 15%, you know, capital gains right here in Virginia. Well, you or you know, in for us, well, that's the Virginia actually has a capital gains tax um as well on anything so i think it's a four or five percent gain so you're actually if you're at 15 you're really at 20 and if you're at 20 you're really at 25 for cap gains right um, in some cases it's actually ordinary income so people we think they're going to get a tax break they're not so depending on what your cycle looks like for uh you know uh, brokerage accounts and investment accounts you know that's something that needs to be considered is localized uh tax rates right as we go into this so that's something that uh, we do this one as far as for client service stuff we're going to be digital. Hopefully next time, you know, maybe I'll be at the beach and we'll really be there. <laughs> my background, right. Um, we'll be able to do that. And I think that's the one nice thing about this change. And my hope is that whatever these quote unquote people talk about the new normal, new normal is, is building relationships along long distances and having that still that real feel. Um, that's what my hope is. And we can continue to service and work with clients because we're licensed everywhere. Um, and then I guess the last one too is military based stuff. Uh, certain States actually have, uh, um, I just have a client, they just moved down. He's like 90, almost hundred percent disabled, but he actually no longer has to worry right in the side of the area where he moved. He's got three different facilities that they charge $0 for his long-term care. Right. Um, in that event. So that's another thing to consider, right? So that, that risk now is off that family's table by moving from Virginia to, uh, I'm not quite sure the rules in Virginia, but moving to law to Florida, that's off the table. So, um, but yeah, that kind of thing, that, that, that deals with that one. So, um, but yeah, I love the technology environment. I have, you know, I've seen three or four clients, you know, since March, uh, brief meetings, um, a lot of it actually has been a lot more uh, introductions to people across state lines, you know, a couple that moved to Florida, are supposed to have dinner with for their friends. Well, guess what? I had their meeting with them last night. We'll do a virtual meeting there. So, um, any referral, but we do like the cameras. Um, I think it's a great way to build relationships and it doesn't matter what state you're in. Um, you know, I'm servicing client. Yeah. He's in London right now. You know, he's in England. Um, as long as he's on us soil, I'm good. Um, but yeah, we, cause we deal with a lot of militaries, they move around. So we're able to help and service anybody anywhere. Um, so yeah, so I don't think there's any restrictions on that. I think the last question, Megan was, why is the sky blue? I don't know where that was. <laughs> <one came> <laughs> I don't know who asked that either. <laughs> um, what to do with light rays and how it comes through the atmosphere. Refraction. Yeah. All kinds of good stuff. Um, <laughs> So the other thing that just came in the chat box, what about real estate investing? So as far as like, um, you know, publicly traded REITs, interval funds, things like that, you know, I think that that's still a really good space despite, you know, kind of what we're going through right now. Again, office buildings may not look the same. They may be taken over by data centers, right? They That's a huge thing that um, I, I actually toured one of the data centers down in downtown Atlanta um, that's in one of our investment funds that literally was an old uh, historic literally building, uh, office space building in downtown Atlanta that's now a total data center. So um, data centers, you know, if, if more virtual is going to be the future, if more work, uh, remote work is going to be the future, we're going to have to have more fiber cable in more remote areas. We're going to have to have more data centers. Um, that takes up a huge amount of real estate. Um, the other thing is that if we're, you know, if we shifted, if, if we totally shifted, which I, I don't think this is true, but if we've totally shifted from retail stores where you walk in somewhere to buy something to online, you know, purchasing, then um, where does all this stuff come from? Well, it comes from a warehouse and a distribution center, and that's also a large amount of real estate. Um, so yeah, so I think real estate is still going to be a great investment moving forward, just making sure that it's in the right sector. So using funds that are actively managed, that are moving real estate in the right direction. So I think, yeah, that was, I think that was the last thing I saw in the chat box that came in. Um, there were a lot of other questions, but they're more personal. And so I'm just not, we're not going to address them today. Um, but we'll reach out to you guys individually that ask those personal questions to make sure that we get them answered.
Gotcha. Yeah, I just one thing to, to kind of piggyback and carry on with your conversation about the real estate investment, you know, and stuff like that. So, um, a uh, loan rates are at a low. So, you know, we, we I don't think we might see the exact same yields coming out of some of the investments we used in the past. But then again, the expenses will also be lower because capital is cheaper. Right? Correct. Um, we're going to see it. So, um, I think you know, in, in kind of my stance out for small individual, maybe stuff that's 10, 15, 20 deals deep for private equity and, and capital raise. Um, I think you know we're, we're been a little bit bearish on that right now because you've got a one in twenty chance of the deal working right, like in that kind of deal, and so you have to be very, very selective in what they're doing, um, especially for ones that are buying, leveraging, and then looking for current income. I think development is still an option because interest rates are low, mezzanine loans are down, properties will be down, so it will actually have that space to grow. So I mm -hmm. think that development side it could be a good play. Um, because it'll be lowering lower, lower carrying costs, you know, for the, for the developer. So it has a place. I think that sometimes, um, you know, it, it's okay to pump the brakes. It's okay to just take a breather and see, okay, what's out there and what are those marketplaces doing um, to adjust? You know, right. um, you know, like there's one that I use that we've used and we use it. They have zero debt. It's a hundred percent funded. Um, AEI does a great job. There are five percent yield is what it's at. They've got they're paying it. You know, one of the other ones that we've been using is a large fund. I mean, Cottonwood's getting ninety two percent of all their their more their their loans paid. Um, you know, our fast mill. You know, there's certain things like that. They're still doing what they're doing. We just want to see what they're adjusting to and how they're making it. You know, I just got the letter from the CFO the other or the CEO the other day. Right, we got it from there. Um, hey, you know what? It's going to put where we, we're going to be pushed back about six months on the total closing of the deals based on what's happening. That's not a right. big, you know what I mean? And that's developmental stuff. And so I, I still think it's got a great place in it. Um, you know, but if we want to get into it, we want to, you know, right now, I think the safest, we want to be across a thousand deals, you know, um, as opposed to three or four, 10 or 12. Um, I, I think unless it's developmental, you know. Um, right. I do it in the developmental. That's just a kind of a part. Yeah. I think it's always a good place in, inside of that world. So definitely. Well, I think we're hitting our time limit here. Yeah. So I wanted to say thank you so much to everyone for joining. It was so good to talk to you guys and be able to answer your questions. We're going to be doing this on an ongoing basis for our advocate clients. So um, if you're not part of the advocate club, just reach out to our team. And um, we hope that you gain some value. We hope that you learned something this morning. And most importantly, we hope that you answered, we answered your question. So appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us for your probably third or fourth cup of coffee. <laughs> um, and um, we'll, we'll aim for a little earlier next time. We just, we had previous uh, engagements this time ahead of time. So anyways, we look forward to seeing you guys soon and hope everyone has an amazing day and hopefully um, everyone's staying safe down in the southern part of our country. Perfect. And uh, please don't keep us a secret. Yes. Yeah. We're here for you, your friends, anyone who needs help. What we've been doing is just scheduling 15 minute uh, phone calls just to answer any questions for them. Complimentary, no obligation. We promise it won't be a sales pitch. So anyways, we've been able to help quite a few people. That's been, that's felt really good. So hope you guys have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks guys. All right. Bye. Bye.